Jenny and I are happy to be back at one of our all-time favorite places. And no one owes more to the Military History Institute and its splendid staff, past and present, than, than I do. And I want to thank Tom for recalling for us uh, Brooks Cleaver, the namesake and honoree of this uh, series of readings in military history. As Thomas told you, Brooks was a fine historian, but he was also a wonderful man. Great person to have as your friend. Privileged to know Brooks. As Tom told you, he was a prisoner of war in World War II. In later years, he liked to host a luncheon on the anniversary of his release from captivity for his friends. And it was uh, always a festive and liquid event and an occasion for uh, telling or retelling many war stories, some possibly even true. So uh, I'm honored to be here in uh, memory of Brooks tonight. I told my friend Don Strari that I was going to be appearing in this, this series, and in response he sent me a message in which he recalled serving with Brooks as his historian when General Strari commanded the Training and Doctrine Command. He said, Brooks ranks high among amongst the very few of the very best command historians. And uh, General Starry is a commander who not only cares deeply about military history, but uh, knows what he's talking about. May Brooks rest in peace. Now, here's my assignment for tonight. I want to tell you about a salvage story. The war in Vietnam ended abruptly with the fall of Saigon on 30 April 1975. During the final days, the United States evacuated all the remaining Americans and 130,000 at-risk South Vietnamese. Among those were a number of senior officers of the Republic of Vietnam Armed Forces, some of whom made their way to the United States as refugees. Within a relatively short period of time, a project was organized to assist some of the most senior former South Vietnamese officers to produce a series of monographs on various aspects of the war as seen from their viewpoints. Six officers joined the project as writers, including General Cal Van Vien, who had been chief of the Joint General Staff, their equivalent of our chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Another officer was engaged as translator and yet another as typist and secretary. A defense contractor, known as the General Research Corporation, was hired to provide office space and logistical support at, a, at its facility in McLean, Virginia. The contractor also put together a small library of basic reference materials, such as a chronology of the war and maps and things like that. The project was formally designated the Indochina Refugee Authored monograph program. That work was sponsored by the U.S. Army Center of Military History and was overseen on site by Lieutenant General William Potts, who for the last several years of American involvement in the war in Vietnam had been the MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam, J-2, the senior intelligence officer. He was instrumental in lining up the participating authors and arranging which topic each would address. Each one of them uh, uh, contributed to uh, three monographs, sometimes as an individual, sometimes in partnership with one other officer, and then there was a fourth one for each one where they all collaborated, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. General Potts also maintained an office on site in the project facility and was often on hand as a mentor and facilitator. The authors constitute a quite impressive group, representative, I will say, of the very best of the South Vietnamese Senior Officer Corps of their day. General Cal Van Vien was the senior military officer in uniform. He served for a decade as Chief of the Joint General Staff. Earlier, he had commanded the Airborne Brigade and, and the Third Corps. General Bruce Palmer, Jr. of our Army said of Vien, that he was a fine soldier and an extraordinary military leader who also took care of his soldiers. Lieutenant General No Quang Trung, 
was widely regarded as South Vietnamese, South Vietnam's leading combat commander. He headed the 1st Arvin Infantry Division during the 1968 Tet Offensive, then 4th Corps in the Delta, then taking over in the midst of a battlefield crisis during the 1972 Easter Offensive, I Corps in the Northern Provinces. General Abrams praised Trung's intelligence, initiative, and resourcefulness and called him the most professionally qualified officer the Arvin had in the field. Lieutenant General Dong Van Quinn was for many years the chief logistician, and then during the last several years of the war, also concurrently the chief of staff of the Joint General Staff. Two pretty big jobs, and he held them simultaneously and did very well. Reporter George MacArthur covered the war for the Los Angeles Times, among others, once wrote about General Quinn. He said he was a man of parts, once having written what Mark MacArthur called a stirring training song entitled Him to the End M-16. Major General Wynn Dewey Hinn commanded the Armor School and the 2nd Armored Regiment, then later the 3rd Arvin Infantry Division, taking that outfit over after it had suffered devastating losses in the early part of the 1972 Easter Offensive and turning it again into a viable combat unit in very little time. Brigadier General Tran Din To was a professional planner and served as J3 of the Joint General Staff for seven years. And finally, Colonel Huang Nok Lung was South, Vietnamese, South Vietnam's J2 Senior Intelligence Officer of the Joint General Staff. Quite an impressive group of officers. Work on the monograph project began at the beginning of 1976. So the war had ended, as I said, 30 April 75. So not much time has elapsed before these officers have come to, come to America, been recruited uh, uh, by POTS and, and the Center of Military History, and put to work on this project beginning in 1976. And it lasted until the end of 1978. So about a three-year a three project. A former Arvin lieutenant colonel named uh, Chu Swan Vien, who had served in the embassy of, of Vietnam in Washington during the final months of the war, was also a key participant in the program. He served as translator of the monographs, which were, this is important, written in Vietnamese and in longhand on long yellow pads by their authors. And then General uh, uh, Colonel Vien took over, translated them, I don't know where the typist uh, uh, came in, either before or after the translations, but uh, that was the process. So what the Center of Military History published over a span of three years was a collection of 17 monographs covering every major aspect of the war. There was even a volume on South Vietnamese society and its impact on conduct of the war, a topic that was addressed, I think, with surprising insight and intelligence by two military officers. The entire collection of monographs written by this group of only six authors represents to me an impressive intellectual achievement. Given, I think this is also important, given that the authors were in most cases significantly undereducated, having been at war rather than in school from their late teenage years on, the results, I think, are even more remarkable. In most cases, a given topic was addressed by an individual author, although there are several collaborative works as well. And uh, you'll smile when I tell you this, perhaps. On the monograph dealing with American advisors, they all took a byline, even the translator. These authors were handicapped by, to a degree anyway, by the loss of the records and archives of their former armed forces because uh, of the, climatic, uh, the, the, the traumatic end of the war. But I'm impressed by how much meaningful detail they were nevertheless able to recapture. Each week, the authors met as a group with General Potts to discuss the project progress of their project. And as the drafts began uh, to become available, they went over the manuscripts together and made comments and suggestions to one another. 
At one such session, retired General William C. Westmoreland, the former commander of American forces in Vietnam, paid them a visit and then took the authors to lunch at Fort Myer. It was an honor to receive him, said Colonel Vienne. And at the end of their discussion, Vienne recalled, Westmoreland left the Vietnamese authors with a stark concluding comment. We betrayed you. I don't think you'll necessarily agree with everything these authors wrote, even from the brief excerpts I'll read. But then the Vietnamese authors didn't always agree with one another either. Colonel Vien noted that at the weekly meetings there were sometimes conflicting opinions, usually between, this won't surprise you, usually between the field commanders on the one hand and those who had served on high-level staffs on the other. And, and this was especially true when it came to accounts of the closing days of the war. It is clear from the prefatory comments in each monograph, however, that the authors were also very helpful to one another, making this what I view as a conspicuously collegial enterprise. When it was finished, General Collins hosted a celebratory dinner for the participants at his home. The monographs cover every conceivable aspect of the war, from combat operations to budgets, from relations with advisors to logistical support, from uniforms to pay, to desertions, to refugees, to bombing, to pipelines, to prisoners of war, to combat rations, to family support, and even, as I mentioned, South Vietnamese society. A considerable amount of this material, and herein lies one of the chief values of this collection, based on first-hand observations of these highly placed Vietnamese authors is to be found nowhere else. Regrettably, the originals of the numerous maps and photographs included in the earlier versions of the monographs have been lost, and the images in the various published typescript volumes were not of reproduction quality. I did some light editing for stylistic consistency and typographical accuracy throughout the collections, but nothing of substance has been changed in any way. The author's viewpoints, always interesting, sometimes surprising, add significantly to the literature of the war, a body of work in which the voices of the South Vietnamese themselves have for long been seriously underrepresented. While it is quite apparent that, that these particular commentators do not, either individually or collectively, provide persuasive interpretations of every aspect of the war, especially in view of all that's been learned in the years since the war ended, their outlooks expressed, as expressed in the period soon after the loss of their country are, to me, valuable, poignant, and ultimately ineffably sad. When it was time for the Center of Military History to publish the results, the material was, to put it politely, under-edited, then issued in a typescript paperback version with spiral plastic bindings. Here's an example of what it looked like. Paperback, little sort of cheesy binding, let's say. Typescript, no, not set, not set in type in any way. And, uh, and not very carefully gone over by anybody who was paying much attention, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Center of Military History said that the monographs were published, quote, informally, unquote, and no one could argue with that. The materials were produced in very limited quantities and given very limited distribution. The result was that many people who would have an interest in them were unaware of their existence, and people who did know about them found it difficult to obtain copies. It took me several years of what I will characterize as fairly diligent effort to assemble a complete set. Given that these were government publications, however, they were thus in the public domain. So when Texas Tech University Press approached me about finding materials that might be suitable to continue their modern South 
East Asia series, I suggested a collected set of excerpts from the monographs. Texas Tech all allocated me 450,000 words, about the same length as my earlier edited work, Vietnam Chronicles, the Abrams Tapes, also published in Lubbock. That permitted me to include just under half of what I estimate to be the million or so words in the monographs taken as a whole. So, so this is, let's say, 45% of the whole, the whole maybe would be about like that. Um, in deciding what to include, this will not surprise you, I don't think, uh, the criteria I used were to include those things I found most interesting or most historically significant and hope that there was considerable congruence between those two categories. In an introductory essay for the volume, I point out that these monographs were written very soon after the end of the war and that that context adds pathos and perspective to what the authors had to say. They were still understandably shocked and saddened by the experience of the tragic loss of their country and of their lives there and literally of the lives of so many who had served under their command and by beginning new lives for themselves and their families in an adopted country. An adopted country for whose succor they were no doubt grateful, but bittersweet largesse nonetheless from a sometimes ally who had just abandoned the, them on the battlefield in their hour of greatest need. Their outlook when these monographs were written with little time to heal from the traumatic events they and their families had so recently undergone colored their accounts to no small degree, or so it seems to me. I think, for one, that they're in many instances, instances far too hard on themselves and on the Vietnamese in general, both politically and militarily. They make few excuses and instead are forthright in assigning and assuming blame. Much of the material in these monographs is primarily of interest to specialists in such matters as logistics, intelligence, communications. Others deal with each of the major battles from Tet 68 through what the author calls unblinkingly the final collapse. For this evening's session of readings, I've chosen a few relatively brief excerpts that I believe would be of interest to a wider audience. First then, here is a segment from Colonel Huang Nock Lung's monograph on intelligence. Early in his discussion, Lung noted a key disparity in the contexts in which intelligence could be sought in South and North Vietnam. Denied the capability to collect adequate information about the enemy outside South Vietnam, he wrote, and forced by internal political circumstances to operate a fragmented intelligence apparatus, South Vietnam intelligence agencies were ill-equipped to perform their crucial tasks. In fact, he says, one might wonder, as in the other aspects of the war, whether internal rather than external factors most influenced the course of the war and brought about its tragic conclusion. The usual contention was, adds Lung, that culture, language, customs, manners, and traditions never really constituted true obstacles because both sides were Vietnamese. To intelligence personnel, however, these are precisely the factors of considerable importance that could spell the difference between success and failure. In 1967, writes Colonel Loom, 1967, it was realized for the first time that intelligence in Vietnam focused solely on enemy military forces and ignored a not less important force, the communist political force, also known as the Viet Cong Infrastructure, or BCI. As a result, says Lung, a new effort was initiated on a national scale to root out the BCI, and the National Police was allowed to expand in order to cope with this extensive task. Colonel Lung also discusses the Phoenix program designed to identify and neutralize members of the VCI, noting that it provided for coordination between intelligence 
and tactical operations with the aim of permitting immediate tactical response that would lead to destruction of the VCI. In what I view as a highly controversial conclusion, Colonel Lugan stated that the VCI suffered a devastating blow in 1968 when its forces came out in the open during the Tet General Offensive. The resulting losses, he said, were such that it never again matched the magnitude and performances of the past. Not until 1969, however, continues Colonel Loon, did intelligence, cooperation, and coordination between MACV and the JGS become really close and effective. This was due, he says, to the professional interest given to the combined intelligence effort by the Chief J-2 MACV, then Major General William E. Potts. In addition to weekly combined staff meetings, says Loon, General Potts also took the unprecedented step of discussing the situation and exchanging professional viewpoints with his counterpart, that was Loon, and generally made himself available for every worthy discussion. Of particular interest to me are Colonel Loon's comments on surprise and the 1968 Tet Offensive. My biography of General Westmoreland is now in press and will be published next October. In his memoirs, General Westmoreland made strenuous efforts to demonstrate that he had not been surprised, or at least not all that surprised, by Tet. But, writes Colonel Loon, when the communists launched their general offensive against cities across South Vietnam in 1968, including Saigon and Hue, almost everybody agreed that it was a total surprise. Loon continues, the general populace of South Vietnam felt that the intelligence establishment had failed to discover the enemy scheme. Moreover, casting the blame on intelligence was partially justified. Any military offensive must be preceded by preparations. There was no reason why an offensive of such proportions should have entirely escaped the prying eyes and ears of every intelligence agent. Strange as it may seem, said Loon, no one reproved U.S. intelligence for this common failure but they did reprove the United States. Listen to this. One widespread popular Viet Vietnamese belief at that time was that the United States had entered into a tacit agreement with the communists to let them proceed with a military action designed to bring about a quick political solution of the war, collusion with the enemy. On the Vietnamese side, says Loom, no timely warnings were issued, nor were there, was there any indication that enemy action was imminent. Two days before the outbreak of the offensive, there was a decision to reduce the Tet truce from 48 to 36 hours and to confine 50% confine of troops to barracks. However, he says, at the time the communists began their attacks on the second day of Tet, most Arvin garrison units were left with only a scant 10 to 20% of their combat strength. The majority of troops were absent to celebrate Tet with their families. In fact, President Chu himself was not in Saigon. He was quietly celebrating Tet in Mito, home of his wife's family. So, says Loon, intelligence had failed. There was no question about it. And in a fascinating conclusion to his longer discussion, Colonel Loon states his conviction that South Vietnam's basic weakness in the war was taking too lightly the enemy's will to carry out his plans. Another monograph. I thought you might like to hear something about territorial forces, the elements that put the hold in clear and hold when General Abrams took command of American forces and instituted that approach to conduct of the war instead of the search and destroy tactics favored by General Westmoreland. Lieutenant General No Quang Trung authored the monograph on ter territorial forces, which were a composite of what were called regional forces, those reported to province chiefs, and popular forces controlled by district chiefs. General Trung begins by discussing the period when large numbers of U.S. ground forces were introduced into South Vietnam and virtually took over the war. This resulted, he said, in a number of achievements, but they re represented 
temporary success rather than lasting progress. The key issue, he said, in territorial security remained unsolved as long as the Viet Cong guerrillas and local forces with the support of their political infrastructure were still intact. The territorial forces, thought Trung, had the tougher duty. Territorial forces engaged in pacification support had the tougher duty as compared to the American forces engaged in large unit combat. Compared to search and destroy operations, he said, territorial security activities were immensely more complex. But the virtues of the territorials, he said, were seldom extolled and their accomplishments usually slighted. The, the evaluative misconception seemed to derive basically from prejudice coupled with a nearsighted tendency to measure results only by body count and weapons captured. He said most Vietnamese citizens, especially the city dwellers, were unable to realize that such achievements as Hamlet pacified, the number of people living under GVN control, or the trafficability on key lines of communications were possible largely due to the unsung feats of the regional and popular forces. And says Trung, it was not until the U.S. interest in advising and supporting the territorials began to have an effect in late 1968 that definite improvements in RF and PF performance could be seen. This resulted in better training, better weapons and equipment, and better tasking. Thus said General Trung, gradually in their outlook, deportment and combat performance, the regional and popular force troopers shed their paramilitary origins and increasingly became full-fledged soldiers. From their inception to the very last days of the war, added General Trung, the territorials always made up more than one half of the total strength of the Vietnamese armed forces. At their latest stage of development, the re regional forces numbered 312,000, and the popular forces, 220,800, and, uh, and that constituted more than half of the total armed forces of the Republic of Vietnam. Here's a comment I find very interesting. In fact, a lot of what's interesting in the monographs as a whole are, is found in the details. Trung says, of all the resources used to support regional and popular force activities, perhaps the most popular was the bulldozer. Each military region was provided with the bulldozer company, and bulldozers were truly the most valuable and effective instrument to improve territorial security. A scaled-down version of U.S. Roman plows, these bulldozers were used to clear bushes and heavy vegetation along axes of communication, in large fields of fire, around important military bases, and most particularly to level the enemy's mini bases near populated areas. General Truman also took this opportunity to comment on how the war had been conducted in its various phases. From hindsight, he said, to counter the kind of warfare purported by the enemy to be a people's war, the conventional search and destroy approach was not enough to ensure durable success and to solve the problems of insurgency. Thus, improved and expanded territorial forces filled a crucial role and a demanding one. While regular units said Trung, the divisions, regiments, and battalions could always rest and recuperate during periods of reg relative lull, the territorial forces could not enjoy or afford that luxury. They were perennially, perennially, perennially engaged in the small war with round-the-clock search operations, security patrols, and the task of protecting urban centers and lines of communication within their areas of responsibility. Throughout the major periods of the Vietnam conflict, therefore, the territorial system always performed a primordial role and was aptly regarded as the mainstay of the war machinery. I mentioned to you earlier how every one of the authors took a byline on the monograph about U.S. advisors, including the translator. So there are there's seven authors of this one. I think you can't help but feel some sympathy when it comes to that monograph. 
Lieutenant Colonel Ben, the translator, stated early in the volume that the impact when the United States essentially took over the war was that the buildup of U.S. forces, which started in mid-1965, and the intensification of the war during the next few years towered above the advisory effort and turned U.S. advisors into liaison officers whose primary role was to maintain coordination between Arvin and U.S. units and to obtain U.S. combat support for the Arvin. And he adds, the period 1965 to 1969 saw the role of U.S. advisors almost completely overshadowed by the presence of U.S. combat units and their active participation in the ground war. Despite, he says, a gradual force structure increase, the ARVNAF, that means all of the armed forces of the Republic of Vietnam, were relocated to the role of pacification, pacification support in view of their limited capabilities. Colonel Vien, you may, you may find this very uh, uh, interesting. Colonel Vien also commented critically on Americans' need for creature comforts. The inability of some Americans to adjust to local living conditions, he said, naturally led to the recreation of American environments. This was a cultural trait that distinguished Americans from the French, who mixed more easily with the Vietnamese. It seemed that no American could survive without his PX, his compound, and his daily bath. In the next section, General Vien reflects on his long tenure as chairman of the Joint General Staff. The decade of my command, he said, saw the Republic of Vietnam Armed Forces truly come of age in every respect. Within the space of eight years, they had more than doubled in force structure to become a strong, modern, three-service military organization with 1.1 million men under arms by the time of the ceasefire. In early 1965, he recalled, they were on the verge of losing the military war. In 1968, they stood up valiantly against a most vicious enemy offensive and turned it into a military victory. Twice, in 1970 and 1971, they crossed the national borders and struck devastatingly against the enemy's inviolable sanctuaries and infiltration corridor. In 1972, they stalled and finally broke up a most ferocious and determined invasion by NVA regular divisions on three different fronts. All these exploits, although achieved with substantial support from American firepower, testified to the success of the U.S. military assistance and advisory program. Advisor may have been the hardest American job in Vietnam. Most advisors lacked even basic fluency in the Vietnamese language. They lacked direct authority. They were usually junior to the Vietnamese officer they advised, and frequently they had no combat experience. And they might have been advising someone who had been fighting the war for half a decade or more. General Vien observed tellingly, I know of no single instance in which a U.S. advisor effectively discussed professional matters with his comp counterpart in the Vietnamese language. With respect to reporting to me, as said Vien, who was the senior Vietnamese officer, as I've said, with respect to reporting to me about Vietnamese officers that the American advisors considered ineffective, inept, or otherwise unsuited for command, Generals Westmoreland and Abrams operated quite differently one from the other. It was General Westmoreland's practice to inform me in detail of any case where the U.S. advisor had determined that his counterpart should be relieved, and he reached down as far as battalion commanders with this advice. Invariably, I would have my chief of staff or J-1 investigate each case, and if the situation warranted, I would see that the appropriate changes were made. In the case of General Abrams, however, when he and I traveled together on field inspections, he would often comment tersely on the state of the command and the ability of commanders as he saw it, but he never suggested either the promotion or the relief of anyone. <coughs> Brigadier General 
Tran von uh, Den To, who spent seven years as J3 of the Joint General Staff, spoke admiringly of the American advisors he had known. Their outward appearance, he said, alone inspired discipline and studiousness. Tall, healthy, invariably handsome in their starched uniforms and shining boots, they conveyed the perfect image of neatness and military elegance, a far cry from the usually carefree French instructor of former times in ill-fitted shorts and civilian shoes. Colonel Lung also noted that the commander of one combined intelligence agency once observed that, that during the period of a year, he had had six different U.S. counterparts. My friend Kevin Buckley, who covered the war for Newsweek, told me once about a Vietnamese who told him that in the course of the year he had had 38 different U.S. advisors. I think it's impossible not to feel the pain of people subjected to that kind of circumstance. Com Colonel Lung added that he himself had been especially fortunate that his counterpart, General Potts, was held in the position of Mac VJ2 for almost four years. That, said Lung, was a good indication of the emphasis placed on the importance of the intelligence program by General Abrams. One of the monographs is called The Final Collapse, and uh, General Vienne was also the sole author of that monograph, the last one written and issued in the original series, and, and as I noted, candid, candidly entitled The Final Collapse. He begins with reference to the Paris Agreement executed in January 1973, a document that required the United States and others supporting Allied forces to withdraw, but let the North Vietnamese keep their invading forces in the South. That agreement, concluded General Vien, was, quote, the turning point which set South Vietnam on its inexorable course toward growing weakness and finally total collapse. Over the years, wrote Vien, U.S. military aid and for some time the assistance of U.S. combat forces helped the Republic of Vietnam build a viable force for self-defense. We discussed earlier the, how that grew. It is equally true, he said, that Unfortunately, in the process, this impressive force of the South Vietnamese had become overly dependent on U.S. money and equipment for its own sustenance and on U.S. air power for moral support as well as a shield and deterrent against outright invasion from the North. So, he says, when the United States shifted its policy to negotiation and been, began withdrawing its forces from Vietnam under the expedient program of Vietnamization, the Republic of Vietnam Armed Forces were not entirely prepared to take over, psychologically or physically. How could they, he said, without a substantial increase in the number of com major combat units, effectively replace seven divisions, four brigades, and innumerable support units of the U.S. forces? No amount of training, equipment, or political exhortation, he said, could effectively fill the physical void or ease the feeling of insecurity that set in. Our forces began to stretch and soon suffered the consequence. He said, he says then the turning point came uh, that changed it all. The Paris Agreement was served on South Vietnam like a death warrant. But he said if the 73 Paris Agreement was the starting point, for the demise of South Vietnam and the absence of U.S. intervention was an encouraging sign to the enemy to proceed with his ultimate plan. It was the cutback in U.S. military aid that ex accelerated the whole process and made defeat inevitable. I've saved for last a few words from General Cal Van Vien's monograph on leadership. In this treatment, he included examples of good and not so good leadership at various levels, including Corps, Division, Province, and Battalion. One of his most interesting discussions includes a fe his fellow author, Lieutenant General No Quang Trung, who in the midst of the 1972 Easter Offensive took command of I Corps when things were not uh, going well there. Recall General Vien, the people of Hue City began to flee south toward Da Nang, creating an incredible spectacle spectacle of frenzy and chaos. 
In the city itself, throngs of tattered and hungry, hungry troops roamed about menacingly like wild animals, ransacking houses, looting, and turning the place into a nightmare of terror and decadence. Then General Troon came on the scene. And Vienne describes how he laid out a new plan of defense and then counterattack, and how remarkable it was that he was able to, to achieve what he did. He omits to mention what uh, General Abrams uh, uh, later told us about Trung's first actions upon taking command. He went on the radio and television, and he said to the people of, of Way and environs that he was back, that he was going to defend Way, and that friendly forces would not fall back. And recalled General Abrams, he called on every soldier to report back to his unit at once, adding that those who failed to do it would be shot. That had a good effect, as General Vienne observed in finishing his account. I will end the readings with General Vienne's final sentence. I conclude this monograph, he said, on a note of hope and with prayers for the reemergence of a free South Vietnam in the not too distant future, a South Vietnam led by men of talent and high morals, the truly great leaders of Vietnamese history. Now, as Mike Lynch has pointed out to you already, today is the first day of Tet, the Lunar New Year. Of the 12 animals in the repeating panoply of the zodiac, this is the only year in which they differ between Vietnamese and Chinese usage. The Chinese regard this as the year of the rabbit. For the Vietnamese, we are beginning the year of the cat. The cat, they say, is known for sensitivity, gentleness, and kindness. My dear friend Ha Mai Viet, a former armor colonel of armor, Arvin, wrote to tell me that his youngest daughter, Kui, was born in the year of the cat. They said that Kui should have the good characters of a cat. I think so, he said. It, it is very good. Incidentally, Colonel Viet will be the speaker here on the 20th of April. I hope many of you will be able to attend. In the spirit of the new year, I would like to close by commenting briefly on what I consider the splendid contributions to our culture and, yes, to our economy made by expatriate Vietnamese who now number a million or more. Others in the new diaspora after the end of the Vietnam War are being similarly successful in Australia, Canada, France, and many other countries. Over the years, I have gotten to know many Vietnamese who came to America, including some of those who contributed to the monograph program. I've had the privilege of assisting and getting to know others who have sought help with producing a book or getting one translated into and published in English. I admire very much the strong family values they embrace, they embrace and teach to their children and grandchildren, their thirst for education, their work ethic, and their ability to put the past behind them and look ahead. In doing so, however, they have not abandoned traditional things. Tet is one, a festival of reverence for ancestors, cordiality to family and friends, and renewal of hope. Another is veneration of Vietnamese culture. Hoa Vet, the wife of my friend Ha Mai Viet, mother of five and grandmother of more, told me about how she handled that when her young grandchildren came to visit. Grandmother, they would ask her in English, may we have a cookie? Sorry, I don't understand you, she answered in Vietnamese. May we have a cookie, this time asked in Vietnamese. Of course, she responded, cookies all around. I am proud of our Vietnamese American countrymen and proud of Texas Tech University Press for publishing the book we've been discussing this evening, an important contribution to getting more of the underrepresented South Vietnamese viewpoint into the history of the Vietnam War. Thank you very much. Mike said we're going to take some questions uh, uh, now. I remember when I was on the faculty here at the Army War College, various faculty officers would be detailed to do Mike's job after lectures. 
and they would uh, tell the student officers that the, the floor was open for questions. Invariably, there'd be somebody there who did not have a question. He had a GD comment he wanted to make, and it was often painful to see them try to wrench those around to appear to be a question. We're open for comments as well as questions. Which eliminates my first warning about <laughs> limit yourself to questions. <laughs> Anyone have any questions, please? We have microphones on both sides. And, sir, please, first and next. I uh, really appreciate your saying that because I am uh, finding it quite difficult to put my comments into the form of a question. <laughs> I was uh, fortunate enough to serve under General Chung and General Cushman in the Delta and a dynamic uh, professional pair. Yes. But even there, uh, there was a sense of apathy in the ranks. Um, when I reported in to the Vietnamese full colonel as a lieutenant colonel, he very politely informed me that I was his 23rd advisor, counting the French. I soon discovered that they had a tw I did not have a 24-7 approach towards the war. Their attitude was hold what you can and don't take any unnecessary risks. An outstanding uh, Vietnamese major on General Chung's uh, staff was openly criticized by his superiors for being too Americanized because he wanted to carry the war to the enemy 24-7. My counterpart uh, thought Saturday afternoons and Sundays were to be devoted to his family regardless of what was going on, and I could never change him that habit. Was, was this problem at all addressed in these uh, uh, monologues? Yes, and, and many others. Um, earlier today, uh, Conrad Crane and I had a discussion, a tape discussion of, uh, of various aspects of the book. And one of the things we agreed upon was the, it was the admirable candor of the authors of the monographs in general. They discussed such things as corruption and its, it, and its effect on effective uh, prosecution of the war. They discussed the limitations of, of effective leadership. And then the, in our discussion of their comments, we observed that when they found ineffective leaders and, and they needed to replace them, uh, the critical question is, where are we going to find somebody more more able than this? Uh, uh, because not only were the forces expanding at a rapid rate, as I mentioned briefly, but they were taking terrible losses. And, and often those losses were taken amongst the more aggressive uh, leaders that they had. So yes, they understood uh, uh, very well what their problems were. They were very candid in describing them. and uh, uh, Despite those uh, problems, it, it seems very clear to me, and they are pretty clear on this too, that the ultimate uh, the der determinant of the outcome of the war was that while uh, we withdrew our support of them, even logistical support, um, the enemy was getting renewed support from its, uh, its patrons, uh, the communist uh, uh, Chinese and the Soviet Union. But your comments are well taken, and, and I'm sure not... Uh, not unique, far from it. And over here, sir. Uh, the American Army, when they got there, they put a lot of information out over the radio. Was there any discussion of how much intelligence the North Vietnamese got off of our radio transmissions, signals intelligence, that kind of thing? Did they have any idea? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an excellent point, but it's not one that I see very prominently uh, uh, mentioned in these materials, but there's a lot of other material, including official publications uh, by, by American military forces that showed over and over again survey teams would be brought out. There's some of this, by the way, in, in my earlier volume in this series called uh, Vietnam Chronicles, the Abrams Tapes. They talk about this considerably there. <coughs> and uh, ASA, the Army Security Agency, and others would come out and they would survey this and they would take the tapes and play them for the commanders of units. This is what you guys are giving away in the clear for free. And, and it was still difficult to get the Americans uh, uh, to be, to be self-disciplined in that regard. So I think that throughout the war, that was a, a, a problem that, that probably cost to, uh, considerably in terms of lives as well as other things. But I don't think there's too much of that in here. They, they were guilty of the same thing, uh, of course. Questions? During my time in Vietnam, the Arvin, for, from our perspective, was a non-entity. Uh, maybe there were operations going on we had no earthly idea of. This was in the Third Corps tactical zone. Uh, 
what was the, uh, the sense of the uh, commentators here regarding the autonomy or the, uh, the uh, separateness of the, of the efforts? That's a really good question. Uh, my answer is going to be conditioned by what I'm doing right now or what I should be home doing right now. Um, earlier today, Jenny and I uh, left Potomac, Maryland and drove up here and I left on my desk the uh, markup from the publisher of my manuscript of the Westmoreland biography, which I'm supposed to turn around on a very tight uh, timetable. So I'll go back to that task tomorrow morning. And um, I, I just, I remember a quotation that I just read though uh, uh, from a senior American officer who said, uh, it, it was very clear, uh, what was very clear was General Westmoreland's disdain for the Vietnamese. Now, of course, in his memoirs, he says something radically different than that. But the Vietnamese understood that, a lot of them, a lot of them did, and a lot of the Americans uh, uh, did as well. The reason I say that is it's very clear in these monographs taken as a whole that the Vietnamese understood very well the difference in outlook between the, well, I'll say, th uh, well, let's say four periods of the war. One period, the advisory period, up until 65 when we introduced major ground forces. Then the period of Westmoreland's command when we were building up, building up, building up those forces and search and destroy uh, is the approach to the conduct of the war and body count is the measure of merit. And then the period af uh, after Tet 68 when General Abrams takes command and we're drawing down our forces uh, in inexorably without respect to what's happening on the battlefield. And instead of search and destroy, clear and hold becomes the tactical approach. And instead of body count, population secured becomes the measure of merit. And instead of neglecting the Vietnamese, as had been done in the earlier period, when they're basically wandering around out there with M16 rifles, I mean uh, M1 rifles about this high, and they're about this high, uh, and facing the enemy, who, by the way, is now getting very good AK-47s and other things from his uh, uh, sponsors in the latter period then, even though we're drawing down our forces, we are giving the South Vietnamese more and better equipment now. They're getting M16s. They're getting uh, PRC-25 radios. Uh, they're getting uh, helicopter support, B-52s, all the things that have been hogged by the American forces in the earlier period. Uh, and so they, they appreciate the difference there, and, and, they, um, the, and, and they see how it translates into, into their effectiveness on the battlefield. Now, as the first comments, though, by the gentleman uh, uh, back here made clear, that that was not an unmixed blessing because as they're expanding the forces to try to fill in behind the American forces withdrawn, their needs for a, a more good leaders uh, are, you know, are increasing accordingly, and, and it's very hard to find more uh, good leaders and so on. So... Uh, Uh, the Vietnamese who comment here are all very senior officers. And, and as, I, uh, as I alluded to earlier, even though they're very uneducated in terms that we would recognize, because after all, they've been at war since they were teenagers. They didn't go off to college or anything like that. They're, they're pretty shrewd and they're pretty insightful and they understand very well the, the second-class citizen role that they were accorded during the, the, the during the Westmoreland years and the, and the radical difference in the latter years, counterbalanced to some degree by the fact there were a whole lot of Americans there helping them in the early part of the war, but then there were fewer and fewer progressively in the latter part of the war, counterbalanced, on the other hand, by the fact that when they were competing with the American forces for all the combat multipliers that you might, you might call them, you know, the tactical error and and helicopters lift and, and uh, B-52 strikes and all that. When they're competing with the Americans, when the Americans start going home, then they get more of that because we don't draw down proportionally that kind of stuff. And so they're better off in that respect. And, and, uh, but what it comes down to the end and the final collapse is a very, a very sad monograph, but a very clear-eyed one. It come down, comes down to the end. The, uh, the Americans default on the key commitments that had been made to the South Vietnamese primarily to induce them to sign on to the Paris Accords in, in early 73. And, and these were made by Mr. Nixon in writing uh, uh, to President Chu of South Vietnam. They were made by his emissaries sent out there repeatedly to make those same uh, representations. Alexander Haig, Henry Kissinger, others. And they were three. One was 
if renewed fighting breaks out, we will, we will introduce mil reintroduce military power to punish the communists for those violations. We're talking primarily here B-52s. That was the first thing. Second, if renewed fighting breaks out, we will replace on a one-for-one -one basis losses of major combat systems sustained by the South Vietnamese. Major combat systems are artillery pieces, tanks, aircraft, as was provided for in the Paris Accords, which foresaw the possibility of renewed fighting. We will replace those on a one-for-one -one basis. And thirdly, we will maintain robust financial support for the South Vietnamese for the foreseeable future. And I'm sorry to tell you that when it came to the crunch, the United States defaulted on all three of those commitments. And in the meantime, the North Vietnamese received greatly increased support of the same kinds from their sponsors, the Chinese and the Russians. And, and my friend Tom Polgar, who was the last CIA station chief in Saigon, described it very poignantly and succinctly in his final message. He says, final outcome no longer in doubt because the South Vietnamese, Vietnamese cannot sustain themselves without our support while the North Vietnamese continue to get robust support from their sponsors. End of message, end of story. I realize that your commenters were restricted to the period from uh, like 64, 65 until the end of the war, but did any of your senior officers have comments on how the effort was prosecuted during the advisory period uh, with uh, only U.S. and uh, non-U.S. forces in country, just advisors? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, and the answer is yes to some degree. It's important to probably to, to know, while all of us do what you do and refer to that earlier period as, as the advisory period, I looked at some statistics uh, in the late in the period before we began to introduce major ground forces, combat forces into the, into the uh, country. And it turns out that of, of X thousands of people we had there, only about mm, 30, 40 percent of them were advisors. And, and others were intelligence people, uh, communications people, transportation people, uh, engineer type people, construction people. And, and so we were doing a lot for them then that went beyond ad advising them. And they rec recognized that and they appreciated that. And, and then they do allude to the advisory effort in that earlier period that you're asking about in, in this way, they compare it to the period after Westmoreland comes and we began to bring in our ground forces and, and how then they started getting a lot less support of the kinds that I've characterized as, as uh, combat multipliers. They got less uh, in, intra-theater airlift. They, they got fewer attack air sorties. Uh, they, they got, I don't remember when B-52s were introduced, but they, they, got, they got less attack air support, let us say. And so they recognized that that was a problem. Yes. They were grateful for the introduction of the ground forces because it's pretty clear that if that hadn't taken place when it did, they were going to go down the drain before anything else could, could, could happen. So that was necessary at the time. There's no, I don't think there's any doubt about that. But then what was, would have been more desirable, and again in my judgment, is after that period of crisis had been uh, dealt with, then to turn one's attention to improving the South Vietnamese armed forces and their ability to sustain themselves and to beginning to root out the infrastructure that in the hamlets and villages of rural Vietnam was through terror and coercion keeping the populace under the enemy's control. And those things in the Westmoreland period were basically ignored. Bob, a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is uh, in 1970 I had the privilege of commanding an air cap squadron in the Second Corps area up in Pleiku. And uh, in my after action report, uh, I mentioned uh, there were uh, many instances where the Arvin units, we supported both Arvin units and U.S. units, and there were many instances where the Arvin units employed the air cavalry squadron uh, better and knew how to better employ us than did U.S. units. And uh, so I, uh, I applaud uh, the Arvin, uh, at least in 1970, and their, and their operations. 
Uh, my question to you is uh, with regard to the monographs, uh, were there a, was there any discussion about cross-border operations, uh, Laos and uh, Cambodia, and if so, do you have any comments on that? Yes, Th thanks for your comment, and I, I, I will just say in response to the comment, um, one, one of the issues I address in the Westmoreland biography is the, uh, the, the um, the dogged insistence on staying with the one-year tour and what its effects were. And um, here are these Vietnamese, some of them, who have been at war for a decade or more. And uh, after a while, they, many of them got it right. And, and, and we, were always, we were always learning. John Paul Venn, many of you know that name, is a very interesting figure in the war. It deserves a better biography than he's gotten so far. Um, used to say the Americans don't have a 10 years experience in Vietnam. They have one year's experience 10 times. And so it's, you know, it's not surprising that, uh, that your, uh, your comment uh, would be valid. In the series of 17 monographs, besides the topical ones that I've mostly uh, quoted from, uh, uh, leadership and, and, and advisory effort and so on, there are monographs on each one of the major offensives beginning with Tet 68. So there's one on Tet 68, there's one on the Cambodian incursion in 1970, there's one on Lam Son 719, the incursion to Laos in 71, and there's one on the 72 Easter offensive, and then there's one on the final offensive, the, the, the final collapse as, as, they, as they term that. And um, Uh, 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 the incursion in Cambodia was a pretty good operation from the standpoint of the Vietnamese and how they performed and how that affected them in terms of their self-confidence and, uh, and their uh, uh, appreciation of the fact that they, they could deal with the enemy uh, in, in, a, in, a, in that kind of way. <coughs> the the, the uh, uh, Cambodian incursion was uh, limited in its effectiveness by a uh, primarily by President Nixon, who uh, I don't want to say he got cold feet, but um, early in the operation he uh, uh, said that it was going to be of limited duration, and he said how long, and it was going to be of limited depth, and he said how far. And so the enemy basically pulled back from behind that dividing line, limiting line, and waited it out, and, and they lost a lot of stuff. You know, a, lo a lot of wherewithal was uh, scarped up. General Abrams' take on the Cam Cambodian incursion was that it, uh, at most, it caused the enemy a little temporary inconvenience, and that, that was uh, probably uh, uh, fairly accurate. In the 71 incursion into uh, Laos, I know we're about out of time, Mike, um, that was portrayed in, um, in most of the anti-war press and a lot of other places, too, including in some of the memoirs of Americans uh, uh, as a pretty rough handling uh, uh, for the South Vietnamese, but, but the fact is they inflicted a, a lot of damage on the other side as well. And uh, there's one other thing I wanted to say about that. Uh, I'm pretty satisfied from the research I've done, and some of which I've published and some other which I will, will soon, uh, that, that uh, the idea to do that was hatched in the White House, uh, probably by Alexander Haig, and hoisted on the MACV and on the on the Vietnamese. So, to the extent that that was a little premature, uh, that, that wasn't necessarily their doing. They did do a lot of good things after Lam Son 719 to um, to um, redress some of the major problems. And I would say the probably the major problem was most of the people who uh, commanded at the core level, had never commanded a, a core operation before. There had been division operations, but not too many of those. They'd been brigade or regimental level in their command op operations. And so, and, and a few of these guys had been to Leavenworth, but uh, I don't think any of them had been to War College um, um, or clearly would have won the war. Well, that's probably enough to say about that. Thank you. Well, Dr. Sorley, it's been a, uh, a privilege and an honor to have you here. Uh, we're always thrilled 
to welcome back someone who's done as much research in our facility as, as you have yeah. been and been such a great friend to us and, uh, and, and helped us tell our story. But beyond that, what we ask each of our speakers to do is help us tell a little piece of our Army's history. And this piece, again appropriately on uh, Vietnamese New Year, helps us tell the story uh, that, that, that has largely been lost, and that is the, the story of, of our, our comrades, our, uh, our, uh, our, our brothers in arms in the South Vietnamese Army. Um, due to the, the nature of that conflict, that has largely been lost over the, the years, and what, and, and what your work has done is, has helped us bring that back and helped all of us understand it a little bit better. What we'd like to do is uh, to present you on behalf of Colonel Mark Viney, our director, and the entire staff here at the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, a small token of our respect for, for your work. So and, that's nice. Uh, thanks for your, for your talk. This is a reduced copy of your, yeah. uh, your poster that you'll find outside. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, and you're a great handler. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.